let's summarize the global effects of stroke-related deficits, depending on whether they involve branches of the vertebral basilar circulation, brainstem, or cerebral cortex circulation. First off, look at the branches of the vertebral basilar circulation. That include branches of the vertebral arteries that are supplying medial and lateral medulla, branches of the basilar artery that are supplying the pons, and ultimately the posterior cerebral arteries that supply midbrain and primary visual cortex. We know, for example, that the anterior spinal artery really has several components. It has feeder arteries from intercostal arteries that perfuse portions of the ventrolateral spinal cord. So one of our spinal cord syndromes involved a blockage of the anterior cerebral artery that disrupted the ventrolateral two-thirds of the spinal cord and spared only the dorsal columns. Whereas when we block the anterior spinal artery as it arises from a vertebral artery, that caused medial medullary syndrome. So again, without reprising these, recognize that vertebrobasilar strokes involve the brainstem and kind of the hallmark of a brainstem vascular insult was a lateral or a medial brainstem lesion that combined a cross track sign that was localized with an ipsilateral cranial nerve sign. And we use the cranial nerves based on whether they are exiting medially if they were motor mixed if they were lateral to localize a lesion to a specific lateral or medial brainstem vascular territory. But we always saw in a lateral or a medial brainstem vascular lesion a corresponding long track sign. Then we know that the terminal parts of the vertebral basilar circulation are supplying not only the cerebellum, but the terminal components of the vertebral basilar circulation formed a pair of posterior cerebral arteries. And out of that, we got medial midbrain syndromes. We might have lacunar strokes involving the thalamus because of thalamoperforating branches of posterior cerebral arteries. But classically, we illustrated the fact that if we had complete blockage of a posterior cerebral artery, we had a patient that had a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia with macular sparing. And we extended that conversation only by saying that if a patient had a blockage of the left posterior cerebral artery, if the splenium of the corpus callosum was involved, we in addition would have a disconnect syndrome that had a patient develop alexia without a graphia. And again, the rostral ends of these branches, again, supply different medial and lateral brainstem vascular territories, again, with the same aspects of clinical neurology, a cross track sign that's localized with an ipsilateral cranial nerve deficit. Now then, Let's look at the distribution next of the carotid circulation. We call it the anterior circulation. We know, as we alluded to earlier, that aneurysms are most commonly associated with branch points of the internal carotid circulation. We spoke specifically earlier about either end of the posterior communicating artery that's linking the internal carotid on one side with the posterior cerebral, and that was a common aneurysm site, the second most common, but it's associated with compression by that aneurysm by a branches of the corresponding oculomotor nerve. So the most important proximal branch of the internal carotid before it gives rise to the anterior circulation is the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery supplies structures in the orbit but gives rise to a central artery of the retina which blocked could cause an ipsilateral complete anopsia of that eye because that's the sole source of arterial blood supply to the retina. Then what did we say was important to remember about the anterior cerebral artery? First, it involved portions of the homunculus. What part of the motor and the somatosensory homunculus was in the vascular territory of the anterior cerebral artery? 
The answer is primary motor and primary somatosensory cortex that's serving the contralateral lower limb, the contralateral lower limb, giving rise to a hypothetical patient. If there were a blockage of the ACA, they would develop contralateral spastic weakness of that lower limb and complete anesthesia of that corresponding lower limb. Then, patients that develop frontal lobe portions of dementia, specifically frontal lobe abnormalities that disrupt our personality traits and our executive behaviors, may also be attributable to blockage of branches of the anterior cerebral artery. Then, how does that compare with branches of the middle cerebral artery? The middle cerebral artery, we know, supplies the upper portion of the motor and the somatosensory homunculus. So again, classically, in when we block branches of the middle cerebral artery, the patient is likely to present with contralateral upper limb spastic weakness and upper limb anesthesia, as well as anesthesia of the contralateral face and lower face weakness if there is involvement of the corticobulbar neurons. So that's the cortical distribution. But note also that the branches of the middle cerebral artery supply a frontal eye field where there would be gaze disruption contralaterally because a frontal eye field is the generator of contralateral horizontal gaze. Then we know specifically that if we involved only the branches of the left middle cerebral artery, did we get the range of aphasias, motor aphasias, sensory aphasias, Gerstmann syndrome, our pathognomonic of blockage of just branches because of the dominant hemisphere of the left middle cerebral artery. And then when we involved the left parietal lobe, we got the signs and symptoms of Gerstmann syndrome, but if we involve branches to the right parietal lobe, we got a very different clinical scenario, that being asomatic nausea and unilateral neglect of the left side of the body. Then the other important point was the significance of the lenticulostriate branches of the middle cerebral artery. These proximal branches provide the major blood supply to the JNU and the posterior limb of the internal capsule, giving rise to more widespread motor and sensory loss because all of the corticospinal axons are going down through the internal capsule and all of the somatosensory projections from the thalamus are going up, particularly through the posterior portion or limb of the internal capsule. So lacunar strokes involving lenticulostriate branches could commonly involve the internal capsule but also could involve most of the basal ganglia structures as well. Then, what is significant about the anterior communicating artery? It connects the two anterior cerebral arteries together, but it is the most common site of the development of a berry aneurysm that are overall most common in the carotid or the anterior circulation. 